Welcome to Marine Tech Talk, a podcast about how Teledyne Marine's innovative technologies are enabling scientific discoveries and commercial tasks in the world's oceans and waterways. This episode is the second in a special four-part series on Silbo, Teledyne Web Research's autonomous underwater glider that recently made the first ever circumnavigation of the Atlantic Ocean by an unmanned underwater vehicle. In this episode of Marine Tech Talk, we are joined by Justin Shapiro, a former applications engineer with the Slocum Glider at Teledyne Web Research. Justin discusses the recovery of Silbo in Ireland, the training course that the glider team was able to arrange there while Silbo was being cleaned up and refit, and the planning and work that was done during leg three of the journey in the Canary Islands. Now here's our guest, Justin Shapiro with the host of Marine Tech Talk, Melissa Rossi. Welcome to Marine Tech Talk. Uh, Welcome to both our returning and our new listeners. Today we'll be discussing the second leg of the Silbo journey from Ireland to Cape Cod. Uh, For that discussion, I welcome Justin Shapiro today, who was at the time an applications engineer on the Web Research Glider Support Team. Justin then moved on some, to some other adventures, but he's joining us today to talk about this particular vehicle and journey. So, hey, Justin, how you doing? And uh, welcome to the show. Doing great. Thanks for having me, Melissa. Uh, great to see you again. So can you tell me um, for a little bit of background what you were doing for the glider team when you were working here with Teledyne? Let's see. Uh, when I was at Teledyne, I was working as an applications engineer on the support team. And the kind of work that I was involved with on a day-to-day basis was uh, kind of uh, final production of gliders, uh, local testing of each platform as it went on the door. Uh, I'd help uh, the engineering department with uh, special development builds. Uh, we would do new sensor integration and testing for things such as uh, uh, SVS-603 wave sensor, the CTD with an integrated pH, uh, any, any sort of new sensing technology that a customer would want. I would uh, help to ensure that uh, uh, the sensor was integrated in a way that the end user would be happy with the way that it was uh, being used and then the data was being treated as it made its way from the sensor back to shore. Uh, I would also uh, teach uh, the glider training programs and uh, both uh, at Teledyne and at various locations around the world. And if there was uh, somebody somewhere that had a glider that desperately needed field service so that they could make a hard deployment deadline, I'd uh, pack up some tools, get on a plane, and go meet them in a uh, wild and beautiful place to get them back in the water. I'm glad you only had to go to wild and beautiful places. I'd hate to think that you'd have to go to terrible, cold, and and nasty places. (laughs) Well, I I just blocked those memories out. Never cold. Never cold. cold. I guess gliders only uh, like to operate or like to be deployed in warm, nice weather then, right? Nothing but nothing but calm seas for deployment. <laughs> Which we know isn't exactly true. So on the previous episode, I had the chance to chat with Ben Alsup, who explained a lot about the first leg of Silbo's journey. Uh, so I know from my conversation with him that Ireland was not one of the originally intended landing places. Um, but due to some unforeseen events, uh, Ireland was the new location. Um, so where were you when the redirection was determined and how much time did you or the team, um, you and the team have to get over to Ireland? Oh, well, I would say it was on the order of, uh, weeks to months of planning that we had. So we knew that we had a certain amount of battery capacity, uh, which in this case was, uh, like, you know, in, in technical talk, it's like a 10, 20 amp hours or something like 10,000 watt hours. Like we had plenty of, uh, of power for the mission. Uh, the question is more one of like shoring up uh, shore side logistics. So coordinating with a, a vessel operator in order to uh, get the preferred service, which is uh, more or less a, a boat with uh, either low freeboard or uh, a jib arm crane over the side or a knuckle boom uh, to be able to snap hook onto the glider or uh, recover it by hand. Um, yeah, so it, it, 
usually takes a couple of weeks to find uh, the right guy to to run the boat to bring you out to uh, to your vehicle. Uh, fortunately, uh, on the west coast of Ireland, they have a number of uh, whale watching services that are able to uh, provide this sort of uh, a rolling function. You know, one of the uh, one of my favorite aspects of underwater gliders is that the launching or, like the vessel that you can launch recovery from is has pretty minimal requirements. So uh, not that right. every boat will do, but pretty much any old boat will do. Yeah. Um, so we had, we had a couple of weeks. The old vessel of opportunity. Yep. Uh, and in that downtime, we were actually able to put together uh, a glider training workshop in uh, Galway um, at the Marine Institute there. Uh, and that ended up being okay. a pretty full course. Uh, so it was, it was, we had enough lead time to, uh, to put that together. I was going to say, that's pretty quick to be able to um, reschedule or to schedule in a whole training course, given that that wasn't even your original intended location to land. Yeah. Um, fortunately, the, the training courses don't take, uh, it's, Ben's got the, the art of, uh, of the training course pretty well honed. Um, and the, the contacts that were, were there were, you know, they were, they were looking for a training course in Europe that year. Uh, so whether they were going to mm-hmm. you know, take a trip to Spain for that training course or, uh, or we were able to bring the training course to them, it was, uh, mm-hmm. it's just a matter of finding the right, the right classroom space. Oh, cool. So Silbo, by the time Silbo reached Ireland, had been in the water for about 11 months, 330 days, I think we calculated, um, and there'd been a few issues along the way. What was the condition of the glider when it finally got to Ireland? Uh, it was surprisingly clean. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too bad. There were, there were a couple of gooseneck barnacles on it that needed to be knocked off. But, uh, you know, it, it looked pretty much the same as it did when, uh, when I put it in the water off of uh, Harwich Fort. Um, and it was pretty cool to have like hand deployed the glider in our rich port, uh, which is Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, and then to, you know, then go and, and receive it there in, uh, in Galway. Yeah. I think that's always pretty cool when you can put something, anything like that in the water, uh, say goodbye to it for 11 months, only be able to trace it, you know, via software and occasional communication when it comes to the surface and then go out and go, Oh, well, here it is. It showed up again. So that's, uh, that's. Great. Good, good reliability for sure. Did you ensure, uh, when you uh, brought Silbo on shore, you said you had done a, a training course. Did you um, use Silbo during that training course or you, were you just there teaching a classroom? Yeah. So uh, the prep work in the days going into the, into the training course, uh, Ben and I visited the uh, Marine Institute for uh, an afternoon. Uh, put Silbo up on uh, the lab bench that we'd use uh, for the training course, just like took a look at the environment to make sure that, uh, you know, there would be room for students around the table, uh, that we'd have like a nice proper environment. We took a look at like the, the tank that we'd use for, for ballasting, uh, took a walk down to the dock that we'd be using to put Silbo down uh, from the dock onto the boat to take the vehicle out into the uh, Galway Harbor to do a little bit of test flying. Uh, which is normally the, the third day of the course. Um, yeah, so we, we pretty much just took the walk around and then uh, we uh, had taught a number of courses together. So we from there, we were, we were ready to go, you know, made sure the uh, laptop connected to the projector just fine and uh, went on our way <laughs> to enjoy Galway for... Uh, All the big technical uh, details. Well, you know, technical details aside. But uh, no, I, I think the first time the vehicle was cracked open the, in Ireland, it was cracked open to, to demonstrate to the students how to like, uh, how to crack open the vehicle. Um, yeah. And when, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And the last time that the vehicle was sealed before it uh, splashed into the ocean, it was sealed by students who were, uh, you know, they'd adjusted the ballast. They swapped out the batteries. They changed the O-rings. Um, that was kind of like their, their, their final test for, uh, for glider training school was uh, our trip across the, uh, well, across the, the North Atlantic from Ireland down to the Canaries. So it was uh, really, we'd, we'd been through enough training courses together to, to know and the students, to be able to watch the students, see, make sure they're, got, they're doing a good job. Um, and it, that's really the, the type of training that you 
watch or receive out of that course to kind of, you know, develop the confidence to actually go ahead and put something into the ocean and, you know, have a reasonable expectation that it's going to operate properly and be able to take on, you know, a multi journey. Yeah, what a great world, uh, real world um, experience to be able to do that live with a glider that's, you know, sort of making this epic journey a- across the ocean. So, um, and, and neat that more people got to interact with the glider on its run around the Atlantic, uh, not just our crew. So it's nice. It's interesting to see how many lives it actually touched going around. For sure. I, th- I think it really drives home, the, at least for those, those students who could actually track the glider that made its next leg, uh, kind of the robustness and reliability that they could expect out of the product. And like, in reality, like with given the same equipment, they could make the same decisions and, you know, achieve the same order of magnitude of, uh, of performance. Yeah. So how long was Silbo actually on land in Ireland? Do you recall? I think it was stored at the Marine Institute for about three weeks. Uh, during those three weeks, we like shipped them. We shipped, uh, batteries up there and got those like cleared through customs and Went through that experience, uh, shipped the kit, uh, the kit of tools that we would use on the glider, so we didn't have to hand carry them through the airport. Because uh, it's quite, a, it's quite a drive from uh, the airport out to Galway. Yeah, uh, and for the for the most part, you know, the uh, Silvo is just shoved into some corner, uh, collecting dust, uh, ready for us Aww. to office and alcohol wipes and. Uh, get, get to work when we got there. I don't know. It seems to me like she should be like on a day ass somewhere. You know, she have, should have some area of prominence considering what she'd already been through and where she was going next. So uh, in the corner just doesn't seem right. If it makes you feel any better, <laughs> when we did uh, a transatlantic glider journey, the first transatlantic glider journey uh, at Rutgers, uh, the glider that made it ended up in like a very lovely exhibit in the uh, Air and Space Museum down in D.C., which was 100% true. I saw it there. Yep. Um, so that, that, was, that was the exhibit that just kind of took the cake. Oh, I know. But Silbo deserved her day as well. But uh, Well, the difference is Silbo isn't retired yet, you know. Silbo's not done working. We don't know. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, so when she was in, uh, in Ireland, did you guys already know that you were going to put her out to the Canary Islands next? Or... Did that sort of evolve while you were there? I mean, was that originally the plan? We we had that kind of plan in mind. And it was the type of thing where, you know, a lot of things had to go right in order to, in order for the schedule to stack up such that we'd be able to switch from uh, the east-west journey to a north-south journey uh, at a time when we would have, uh, when we had other commitments kind of lined up for the Canary Islands. Yeah. And, what were those commitments? Uh, so annually uh, on the Canaries, the institution Plocan runs uh, what they call a Plocan Glider School, which is kind of it's an advanced introduction to all of the available glider technologies from uh, all of the major manufacturers of underwater gliders. So uh, Teledyne uh, has supported this program for uh, probably over a decade. Uh, there's a representative from uh, Kongsberg Sea Glider that I guess that, that now like Kongsberg uh, Hydroid uh, Eng- Engel Ren- Reynolds Engel uh, Huntington Ren- Huntington Engel yeah Hun- Huntington Engels I think uh, so they always have a representative there to show off the, the Sea Glider technology um, the French Glider manufacturer. Uh, has been showing up to show up their technology. Um, and then uh, there's also a rep from uh, Wave Glider Liquid Robotics that uh, I think they normally telecon in to, to describe how uh, Wave Gliders can be used with underwater gliders. Um, yeah, so uh, that was uh, one week of our experience in the Canaries. Uh, another week, uh, so during that, we uh, a lot, we give students the opportunity to get their hands on all the various glider technologies. And then we spend, uh, I think that year we spent two days out on the uh, water uh, so that students could see the launch and recovery operations of the different technologies. Um, you know, if, if they're to make a, a decision based on, uh, you know, logistics, complexity, uh, one of these variables, they'd be able to see the full uh, 
the full works from vehicle in the lab to vehicle in the water um, and make an informed decision. Uh, while I was there, uh, the PLOCAN was taking uh, delivery of uh, one of the first G3 production vehicles. So the, uh, when I, while I was there, I did what we called a, a training update. Uh, it wasn't a kind of a full training because PLOCAN has many, many years of operational experience running uh, Silicon G2 gliders. So their technical staff just needed kind of an update as to like, what do we do with a G2 glider versus what do we do with a G3 glider and how do we adapt our knowledge? And much of the knowledge is a direct transfer. There's uh, the, the ecosystem was intentionally kept intact such that uh, a G2 user could switch over to using a G3 feature and they really just need to know what are the new features of the G3 uh, and how do I use them effectively. Um, so that opportunity was kind of presented to them as uh, like get the, get the most value out of these new technologies as quickly as possible. There are also some repairs that I did to a G2. There's a, a blown H-bridge motor driver on a circuit board uh, that had happened in the lab. And uh, there was a, an oil and gas technology workshop. Uh, so I made a presentation of that, which kind of uh, kind of a high level presentation over all of the uh, Teledyne Marine Systems offerings from uh, like, uh, like Gavio uh, Web, uh, and like the acoustic technologies were all presented. So before, when we were still back in Ireland and you were getting ready, I guess, to deploy, did you actually pilot uh, the vehicle or were you guys piloting the vehicle from Ireland to the Canary Islands? And did you do that from Ireland? Because I think it was in the water for almost 175 days or something like that. So um, you must have come back, I would think, before you went to the Canary Islands to do that next bit of training and, and participation there. Definitely. So uh, we, after we deployed, uh, we, we actually had a little bit of staggered travel, uh, which helped to accommodate kind of not quite around the clock operations, but just like keeping a, keeping somebody on, on staff to receive an abort message if it wants to come. Uh, so when we actually deployed Silbo, uh, Ben and I were both in uh, Galway. Um, and we we're just getting uh, Silbo tuned back, dialed back in to like optimal performance after battery swap, uh, and started driving her south. And then uh, I think we were there two days after the deployment, maybe three. Uh, and then I flew back home. Uh, and while I flew back home, uh, Ben uh, and Co and I believe Chris DeColibus were. Uh, trading off piloting responsibilities. And then uh, when I got back, uh, Chris and I shared piloting responsibilities and, uh, and Ben and his wife, Erica, uh, went on some vacation time, much needed vacation time in, uh, in Ireland. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we would re we'd regularly just swap over what we call considered daytime piloting operations, which for this glide, like since we'd flown Silbo for, you know, close to a year already, we kind of had the, we kind of knew that we should check in on the data maybe once a day just to make sure that, you know, power consumption was as normal. Uh, profiles were completed to depth. She was calling in at the expected period of time. And then uh, as part of the body support team, there's somebody on call 24 seven with what we call the bat phone. Um, and whoever, whoever was carrying the bat phone was responsible for, uh, making sure that there was an appropriate response in the event that there was an abort. Um, you know, during the uh, Ireland to Canaries leg, there was no abort. So that person uh, didn't have much to do, but they were there just in case. So what data was Silbo actually collecting um, on her route from Ireland to the Canaries? Was there something planned there? And was it mostly shallow or, or a combination of shallow and deep? There is a little bit of shallow flight uh, kind of getting off of the uh, West Ireland shelf into North Atlantic deep water. Um, but, uh, and then on the actual flight, I believe she was just collecting uh, CTB data. So that's, uh, you know, density data, which gives you uh, sound uh, velocity profiles. Um, yeah, and I believe that deployment, uh, we switched 
sailboat over from uh, like between battery technology areas. So kind of from what we call the, the three series batteries, which is literally three uh, battery cells in series uh, to a four series battery. Um, so uh, this was kind of the first long deployment of those battery cells. And since that flight was, if I'm not mistaken, that was about a five month deployment uh, as opposed to like a one year deployment. So we actually took a uh, converted silvo during that from an extended glider down to a, a standard length glider, um, which, which would allow us to do more or less a full battery drawdown uh, during the deployment instead of, uh, you know, with the extended battery glider, you end up adding about a third of the capacity of batteries. So uh, a third additional capacity. So it would be another about year, year plus of operations. So then we took that battery section out to uh, decrease the endurance to about you know five, six months. Um, yeah, so we kind of wanted to get a feel for what the full battery capacity of those was. And yeah. Did the extended batteries need to be added back in once you got uh, when you got back to the Canary Islands before it could um, head home at some point? Because I know the the deployment between the Canary Islands and the the um, next stop, which was St. Thomas, was pretty long too. That one was actually over a year in length. So did they have to? Uh, do you know if they had to um, add those uh, extra batteries? Yep, that was added back in. But, uh, you know, adding and removing the batteries is just a matter of tweaking ballast and uh, adding in a, a modular payload section. Uh, all the wiring gets to stay intact. Um, so it just took shipping the section that we'd removed in Galway. Uh, I, I believe it went back through the, the shop uh, on its way to the Canaries. Uh, so it just took, uh, you know, shipping three batteries instead of two over to the Canaries and then getting that that whole section sent over uh, in advance of the preparation work. So I want to thank you for joining us um, and giving us uh, the overview of what happened on that second lang. Really appreciate it. Um, it's really making an interesting story as we kind of talk to everybody who's touched Silbo along the way. Uh, I know Ben gave a webinar uh, back in August about the overall journey, but it's nice to finally talk to everybody that was involved uh, not everybody, because I know there were extended crews on the ground and all of the organizations that we collaborated with on site, but to get a chance to speak to some of the people who are actually working with the vehicle uh, in the different locations. It was great to have an opportunity to, to be a part of it and to, uh, you know, to still be a part of it. Yeah. And, and again, great to talk to you again, Justin. It's been a while since you left here. I haven't seen you, but you look great and it's nice to see you again. So hopefully we'll talk again soon. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Marine Tech Talk podcast. For more information on Slocum gliders, visit our website at teledynemarine.com backslash slocum dash glider. There's a press release on the website that also details the journey as well as a recorded webinar on the journey that can be found on our link webinar channel. For more information about how Slocum gliders are helping researchers and commercial customers explore and understand the ocean, you can Google Slocum gliders or search Twitter for posts from our many customers. If you like this podcast, please make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're hearing this show. That way, you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time.